We have a little special video we're making uh, by request. We're going to do a song later on in the service by request of, um, I think, a, a, a person, in Wyoming. person in Wyoming. Precious saint. So hopefully it'll bless you all this morning. But right now we're going to start with some praise music. Please stand to your feet. Join and Boy. sing with us. And y'all can greet each other and sing along with us, whatever you'd like to do. Right now we're going to sing, Let Everything That Has Breath. Praise Him in the morning, praise Him in the evening, praise Him when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise Him when I'm laughing. Praise Him when I'm breathing, praise Him every season of my soul. If we could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, surely we would never cease to praise you. Sing, let everything that has breath. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise Him in the heavens, joining with the angels, praising you forever and today, Lord. Praise Him on the earth now, join with creation, calling all the nations to your place. If we could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, surely we would never cease to praise you. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. If we could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, surely we would never cease to praise you. Sing it with us, church. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, Praise the Lord, let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, let everything that, let everything that, let everything That means you. That's right. We've got one more song this morning. Please join in with us as we lift up the praise to the Lord this morning. The song is called We Cry Holy. You might know this song. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet. Jesus, the greatness of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, holy, holy. Cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Sing that with us. We fall down, 
we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. When we cry, holy, holy, holy. Be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, it's so good to see everyone here this beautiful Sunday morning. God bless you for being here today. I know it's been rough for us to get up and get out in all this wonderful snow and ice and rain. Amen. <laughs> We're so blessed. We don't have any of that today. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful, sunny, warm day. We praise the Lord for that. Like I said, it's so good to see y'all. Those that are visiting back today. And and ask you to pray for those who's traveling, those who's out sick with this old flu stuff that's been going around. God bless them. Pray for all of us. You say away from me. You say yeah. Shake your hand from afar. Yes. Amen. Well, God bless you for being here. A couple of quick things. Um, we got some birthdays this month. Quite a bit in January here that I've been told. And God bless you and happy birthday to each of you. And Oscar May had a birthday. Yes, he did. Amen. And Hope Hughes, she's got a birthday at the end of this month. And Donna Cruz, some folks know her, and Amber Farmer, and some other folks. And got a bunch of them. Uh, trying to remember because I didn't write them down. Anyway, senior moment, and it's okay. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Ms. King. One announcement My before um, we forget this morning. We have an Easter play coming up. Uh, April 1st, No Foolin' is no Easter, fooling. and we are going to have the Children's Church present Woo! another play to you. A lot yeah. of that coming in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So That's if so you good. would like your kid, this is going to be the ages five, six and up. Yeah. So if you'd like your child to be a part of that, make sure you bring them on Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights is when we have rehearsal, and we are going to start next week rehearsing for the Easter play. So sign them up. There's a sheet in the back. Sign your kid's name. We'll be looking for them to come on Wednesday nights. If you'd like to help out in any kind of way, whether it be for props or just some type of support, see me or Caitlin. Also, we will have a vacation Bible school. Ooh, the approximate yeah. date. Yeah. yeah awesome. um, we're planning for, I think, the last week of June. It'll run Monday through Friday, um, 6 to 8. Sunday. Just kind of like a regular Wednesday night, but it's going to be Monday through Friday. And you're, if your kid wants to be part of it, they're not required to come every night. Just if you, can, if you can help out, see us. We are looking for volunteers for things like snacks and games set up and just extra eyes and hands because they're yes. going to need them. Yes. So that's the end of June. Like I said, sign up on the back for yes. Easter play. And if you want to help out in any kind of way for vacation Bible school, see me or Caitlin. Amen. Thank you, sweetheart. Amen. I look forward to that. Amen. The Lord of praise for that. There's so much involvement. I appreciate that. I should keep Lenny Glazer in your prayers. Uh, so going through after the surgery. A lot of health issues on from the surgeries. Keep him in your prayers. I appreciate that. And uh, also uh, the Bright family and passing of, of I'm looking for him. Of your mother. God bless you and your family. Sorry about that. And uh, let's see. Like I say, sign up. And if you notice, we're in some purple today. So if you see someone's in purple today. There's an awareness thing going on. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And our ladies' meeting is tomorrow night. Any of the ladies would like to come out? We go to the schoolhouse at 6.30 for a fellowship time. Come on out. And uh, we're uh, wearing purple in support of Mobius Syndrome Awareness Day, which is actually the 24th of January. So um, if you see someone in purple, that's what's going on. Amen. So God bless you. All right. I'm going to ask this time if uh, 
Dr. Roger Blanchard to come. He's going to be our round robin for the first of this year now. Amen. Come on up, Brother Roger. Amen. Share some of the Lord. He's filling his heart to share with us. Amen. Hobble myself up here. <laughs> Let us pray. Our dear, most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to spread your word, Lord. And I just pray that every word that comes out of my mouth be from you. I ask God in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. How many people in here, should show of hands, has a GPS? Now, I ain't talking about the GPS on your car now. I'm talking about the GPS of God's plan of salvation. Now, how many people has that GPS? All right. Uh, if you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 13. It says, enter ye straight at the gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Yet we we'll, can walk wide open, eyes wide open, straight into trouble. But when it comes to walking straight in God's line, we kind of vary a little bit. Instead of walking that straight line, we occasionally have to go left or to the right. But with our GPS, it brings us right back to it. Unlike the GPS in your car, which can get you lost. It happened with me when I went to Carol's house. I was using my GPS, and it took me a quarter of a mile away from her house. But I got a hold of her, and she set me straight back on the path, just like God will. God will set you straight back on that path. Amen. Now, if you look at Revelations, uh, chapter 20, at verse 12. It's, this is uh, John talking now. And I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before God. Now this is, this is the time where you're going to be judged. And the books were open. And another book was open. He opened up two books. One was the book of life. And the other was the book of the dead. Not to say it's the same book of the dead that the Egyptians used. It's not the same. They were both, we were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And in verse 15 it says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If your name is written in the book of life, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. But if your name is written in the book of the dead, as dad would say, it's going to get awful hot. In John 14, 6, Excuse me here, but Jesus says, and Dr. Cash, the past few Wednesdays and a couple of times up here, have been preaching on this very same subject and teaching on this subject. Jesus said, and it's just Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no way you're going to get to heaven unless you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's God's plan of salvation. 
You can't get nowhere it's by works. Dr. Cash has told that from right here and down there in Sunday school. I mean, Wednesday night Bible study. That works ain't going to get you nowhere except maybe a pat on the back from your fellow man. It ain't going to get you into heaven. But being saved will enable you to do works for God. Dr. Cash said it a couple of Wednesdays ago, and, and, you know, I agree with him because it has happened to me. When you're doing something for God, everything's going to fall right into place. You're going to get it. Like with the furniture bank, when I first went to him about it. I already had furniture to begin with. And then when I made the announcement about it, even more furniture came in. God has really blessed that because I'm doing it for him. Just like Tina with the food bank. She's doing that for God. And I've heard it said several times. They don't know how they do it. It looks like the shelves are going to be empty, but they still have enough food to feed everybody. That's because God's got his hand on it. And when you get saved, God will have his hand on you and bless you with what you need. Not what you want, but what you need. One thing you definitely have to admit to start off with is that you are a sinner. Admit you're a sinner first. Then you can be saved. Because as it says in Romans 3, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all are sinners. Each and every one of us are sinners. We are only saved by the grace of God. And when you get saved, your whole life is going to change. It's going to change for the better. I, I am an example of that. In my younger days, I did drugs and alcohol. Now look at me. God came and saved my soul. I'm even clean of cigarettes. No cigarettes, no drugs, no alcohol. The only drugs I take is what the doctor gives me. And I really don't like doing that either. But I have to. But he's cleaned me up on a whole lot of things. And God will clean you up too. Just by saying... Come to me, Lord. I want, you, I want your blood washed over me. His blood will wash you clean of all your sins. And in Ephesians 2, 8. Come on. They say these things move faster, but they really don't. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not yourselves, it is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift unto you from God. Because he loves us so much. As it said in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that's us, the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I know, how can you have everlasting life? We all die. Yes, the body dies. But your soul does not. Your soul goes to heaven if you're saved. If not, you go to what dad used to say, is old slew foot. One other thing you got to do is realize that you are a sinner. Oh, wrong one. Oh, 
well. We don't want to go to, to put it blankly, to hell. Excuse my language, but that's the truth. We don't want to be in that fiery pit. We want to be where we can celebrate with our loved ones. I'm looking forward to being with dad in heaven. I know mom is too, but we also have other family members up there that we're looking forward to see too. And I'm pretty sure everybody in here has the same thing. I went to Diane over here looking to see Bill again. Yeah. <laughs> But you can't see your loved ones in heaven unless you're not saved. So I'm asking you, before you leave this building today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there will be people down here that at the end of the service that can take a Bible and show you how to get there. And if it's laid on you that you can't wait, just tap somebody on the shoulder next to you and they can take you somewhere to someone who can do it. You don't have to wait to the end of the service, not one bit. Because God's ready to accept you at any time and any place. It don't have to be right here. It can be while you're driving home from here. It can be on your front porch. Dr. Cash did it at the end of the driveway. Jesus called on him and he kept on, he told you plenty of times from up here, he called on him to be a preacher. Dr. Cash kept on saying, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready for it. Then finally it happened to him, didn't it, Dr. Cash? He just couldn't give it up. He, he just had to give in to it. If God wants you, he's going to tell, tell you. He's going to tap you on your shoulder and say, come on. But don't keep him waiting. Don't keep him waiting. When he taps you on the shoulder and wants you to do something, do it. Whether it's being saved, doing something for the church, even going to do a visitation. If that's what God wants you to do, do it. And he will bless you for it. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Roger. Amen. GPS, amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Roger. I appreciate that. God bless you. Uh, at this time, we're going to take our morning tithes and offerings. If our deacons will come forward, please. Appreciate that. We appreciate those listening by radio and watching by television. God bless each of you. We've got uh, Bill Lewis coming on the 4th of February. And bless us in song and Not Easily Broken looks like March 4th. Mm -hmm. And Cornerstone March 25th. And we're looking forward to that as well. And gentlemen.
seated. Come on up, Sister Leela, if you can. You ready? Take your time. Take your time. We need some help on this one this morning. Yeah. Most of y'all know this song. And I just want to shout out to Sister Diane and her dear late husband. They gave me a bunch of songs to practice on, and this is a good old one. Yeah, we'll do that one first. And, and you've heard uh, it here plenty of times here at Solid Rock, but this one goes out by request. Request. What's your friend's name? I'm sorry. Kathy Barrett. Kathy Barrett. Barrett. All the way in Wyoming Barrett. Uh, Barrett. requested this song. Precious woman. Um, so really, really loud. Really loud. Yeah. To yeah. get help those ears from here, or not. But we appreciate requests. We do. And I ask you to also pray for Brother Ron Hamner. Yeah. Um, he's had, had been in the hospital, but he's back in. Um, uh, back home now. Not at home, but a rehab facility. Okay. It's, Heartland. Heartland. Okay. So keep him in your prayers. He said he misses everybody, but to keep him in your prayers as well. Y'all know this one. Clap your hands. Just like that. Walk around me, Jesus. Walk around. Walk around me, Jesus. Walk around. Walk around me, Jesus. Walk around. Walk around my bedside, Lord. Poor mama died. She called us to her bedside. Told us the Lord had been walking all around. In the night she closed her eyes. We could hear her singing. Walk around me, Jesus. Walk around. Walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around my bedside, Lord. When I am praying, walk around. When I am praying, walk around. When I am praying. Walk around, walk around my bedside, Lord. When I am dying, walk around. When I am dying, walk around. When I am dying, walk around, walk around my bedside, Lord. Walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around my bedside. Walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around me, Jesus. Walk around, walk around my bedside. Walk around my bedside, Lord. Amen. Praise His name this morning. Amen. That is so good. Thank you, ladies. Y'all walk real nice. Amen. Appreciate that. There we all are the breath. A little Amen. workout in there with that one. It's going to be a time of the day. We won't be out of breath. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I'm uh, just so thankful to the Lord. God bless you. He is there no matter what's going on. Right. Call upon him. And this is another one we like. Uh, send it out to those. Um, it's going to be a time. Whether we have a lot of loved ones that's gone on here last year or so. And it's going to be a time. Well, and even for friends of ours that we may not yes. ever see in this lifetime that we've made, you know, from across the country, across the through country. the internet, across the oceans. You know, we might not be able to meet here in this lifetime, but there is a place that we can meet. Uh, we can meet by the river. By, the river. by the river. Amen. It's a wonderful place. Amen. I read of a city, John saw coming down from God out of heaven Walls of jasper, gates of pearl, and streets of pure gold He tells of a pure river of life 
that falls from the throne. And when we have reached that beautiful place, we're known as we're known. Let's be by the river over on that beautiful shore. Let's be by the river where loved ones dwell who've gone on before. If you leave here first, just wait by the river. If I leave you here, that's where you'll find me. Let's meet by the river over on that beautiful shore. That'll be some happy time, won't it? If you leave me standing here on this earth, just wait by the river. It's a good place for us to be. And after I find you, let's go see Jesus. Then let's go find our dad and our mother. Let's meet by the river over on that beautiful shore. Let's meet by the river over on that beautiful shore. Let's meet by the river where loved ones dwell who've gone on before. If you leave here first, just wait by the river. If I leave you here, that's where you'll find me. Let's meet by the river over on that beautiful shore. Let's meet by the river over on that beautiful shore. Let's meet by the river where loved ones dwell who've gone on before. If you leave here first, just wait by the river. If I leave you here, that's where you'll find me. Let's meet by the river over on that beautiful shore. Let's meet by the river over on that beautiful shore. The ladies in purple. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I see smiles on your faces. Amen. It looks good on you. Amen. God bless you for being here today. This time our children's church is dismissed. Those nine and under. Just follow them in the back there. And they'll take them upstairs, sign them up. It's been grand. Slide them on up. Yeah, because I'd have to crawl up the step. Down. <laughs> God bless them. Appreciate it. I'm going to ask Brother Mike Duff to come forward for our morning scripture reading. I'm so glad to be in God's house today. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm half asleep this morning. I got in the bed this morning at 4.15. They put my mother in the hospital last night. for. She's got something going on. She's uh, dehydrated and... You know how that goes. So, but I'm going to tell you folks, if y'all haven't been to the hospital lately, that place is packed to the walls over there. Everybody's got a mask, and they're setting up tents outside trying to keep people from coming inside the hospital. It's so, these people are so sick. So it's a time to really pray. Please keep my mother in your, in your prayers, and keep my family in your prayers as we all go through struggles in this life. Today I'll be reading, I'm, I've read this before, but I'm reading John 14. I'll be reading 15 through 31. If everyone would please rise for the reading of God's word. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, who leads into all truth. 
The world at large cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you do because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. In just a little while, the world will not see me again, but you will, for I will live again, and you will too. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who obey my commandments are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them. And I will reveal myself to each one of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, all those who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and live with them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not do what I say. And remember, my words are not my own. This message is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the counselor as my representative, and by the counselor I mean the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I myself have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give isn't like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you will be very happy for me, because now I can go to the Father, who is greater than I am, I have told you these things before that they happen so that you will believe when they do happen. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the prince of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Mike. This morning we're going to be looking in the book of Ecclesiastes. That's just a little ways after Proverbs. A book that was written by the great King Solomon. The richest and the wisest king that ever lived. But what I'm going to talk to you about is a subject that at least half of this church understands on a personal note, but it's just something you don't talk about in church. Y'all know I'll do it, though. <laughs> and it's a subject that when we bring it up, we tend to say, well, you know, no, nah, that, that ain't me. I, I don't have a problem with that. That's, that's for somebody else over there, you know, because that just makes you look unspiritual. And people will look at you and say, well, you know, because they got that problem, maybe they don't have all their act together with God, maybe. But that's not true. What I'm going to talk to you about is depression. A lot of people are afraid to admit that they deal with it. And so they deal with it in another way that makes it even worse. They don't talk to anybody about it because they're saved and they're supposed to be on top of their game and they're not supposed to have any problems. Well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Amen. If you don't have any problems, what do you come to Jesus for? We come to Jesus because we do have problems. <clears throat> I know y'all are waiting for me to say that I'm a paranoid schizophrenic, so all of y'all can say I knew that all along. <laughs> My mother had me tested, and I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
But King Solomon dealt with depression, big time, big time depression. And a lot of very famous Christians throughout their life dealt with depression, but they just didn't talk about it, but people knew it. But with the help of God, they were able to not only deal with it, <clears throat> but to fight it. And they could function and do great things for God in spite of the problem. Now here in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Solomon wrote down words that reflected his depressed attitude and mood that he was in. He had tried it all, done it all, had it all. But listen to what he had to say. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That means emptiness. Now, how in the world could you be as rich as he was and have a thousand wives and hollow that it's all emptiness? Where would you have time to do that? But he did. He was so depressed that he said, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? What's it all worth? It's just nothing. All of the, he was looking at all that he had and all the work he had done, and he said there was nothing in it, no profit in it. It was worthless. That's coming from a depressed man. One generation passed away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Nobody cares what happens to me. You feel that way sometimes, don't you? I see some people very carefully nodding their heads. <laughs> the sun rises, the sun goes down and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns about into the north. It whirls about continually. The wind returns again according to his circuits. Then he says, all rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. That's actually very scientifically correct. But he was saying it out of depression. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with learning. Hearing. And then he says this, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. He was right. Anytime you look at something stupid somebody did and say, I've seen it all now, that happened a long time ago. Things that you would never think you would ever see, it happened a long time ago. But he's saying it out of the depths of depression. He's just in so much despair that nothing brings him pleasure. And people that suffer from depression understand that sometimes, that when you are in one of those modes, that nothing really matters. And you will try everything you can to get out of it. And he's going to tell what he tried, so I can save you a lot of grief. He said, is there anything where it may be said, see, this is new? It hath already been of old time which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be remembrance of things that are to come with those that come after. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And so he tells us this out of his despair. I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail, that word travail is almost the same as birth pains. Hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith? I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. He said, I have seen everything that's ever been done. I I've done it all. I've seen it all. And everything is still just emptiness and it vexes my spirit. That which is crooked can't be made straight, and that which is warning cannot be numbered. He's saying that out of depression. And then he speaks to himself. He said, I commune with my own heart, and said, Lo, I have come to great estate, 
And I have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. And that's true. The Bible said there was never any man that was given more wisdom on earth than this man. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom. And I gave my heart to know madness and folly. And I perceived that this is also vexation of spirit. In other words, there's got to be something out there that can help me. There's got to be something I can do that will cure this, that will pull me out of this depth of despair that I am in. And then he makes this statement, for in much wisdom is grief. Have you ever noticed that stupid people are happy all the time? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that UFOs only appear to idiots? The rest of y'all will get that. The, you know, people that don't know no better are happy. Most people that suffer depression are deep thinkers. And most of them are very intelligent because why? Because they know what's going on. They know what's going on in the world and it grieves them and they suffer depression a lot of times as a result of it. For in much wisdom is grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. My pastor, the last pastor that I had, people would tell him bad news sometimes and he'd go, I'm sorry to know that. Yes. <laughs> Took me a while before I understood what he was saying. Because it does. As a pastor of this church, I hear everything. People call me, and if they can't get me, they get her. Usually they get her more than they get me. I got a great big bottle of Maalox on my desk. That's a fact. And I'm just about done with that, ready to start on a fresh bottle. Every time the phone rings, I have to take a sip. It's tough sometimes. And a lot of people are dealing with some deep problems. And in much wisdom is much grief. So having said that, in chapter 2, here King Solomon is going to go try everything there is to try to see what will get him out of his depression. Try to cheer him up, if you will. He said, I said in my heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and, and of mirth, what doeth it? He tried comedy. 90% of all comedians are clinically depressed. That's true. It's a fact. More comedians kill themselves than other celebrities, or they die from a drug overdose or whatever. They seemingly are the happiest people in the world at times. They seem like they, I mean, look like everybody would want to be around them. One of my favorite comedians was Chris Farley. He died at the age of 33 from a multiple drug overdose and the last words that he had ever said to a person going out the door is, don't leave me alone. You'd think somebody that funny would have people around them all the time. And so Solomon tried comedy. He brought in probably the best court jesters that he could possibly get. Can you picture that? And it just left him feeling empty. Now, there's nothing wrong with comedy. I mean, I'm a big fan of it myself, but... If you've got that missing, something, that missing factor I'm going to tell you about, it doesn't do a bit of good. Then he said, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see was, what was that good for the sons of men which they should do unto heaven all the days of their life. He tried booze. He and you know, he probably had the, some of the best wine there was, a Chateaubriand one. <laughs> tried all the wine. He, he, you know, he, he tried everything. But it, and, and I'm going to tell you something. If you're trying wine or alcohol for depression, when you come off of it, you're going to be a little further down in that hole. 
Oh, it might make you laugh for a while, but it'll give you a headache when you're done. And people are turning to drugs and everything to try to drown out the problems and try to pull them out of that hole they're in. And it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And Solomon said, I tried it and it did me no good whatsoever. Yeah. And he said, I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. He had houses and land beyond anything you can imagine. And I know people that have these vast holdings and they have these huge pieces of land and houses and all of that on. And you know what keeps them depressed? Taxes. You think you own anything? Try not paying your taxes for a couple of years and you'll find there who owns that farm you got. But some people feel that that would be the answer. If I just had all of this, and, and he said it didn't do a bit of good. Then he said, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. He did all this gardening and landscaping. And there are a lot of people that turn to that kind of work to try to keep their minds straight. And if you get bored, come to my house. I got plenty for you to do. I wish somebody would look to house cleaning to fight depression. I could really use your help right now. That would be ugly, wouldn't it, knowing it wasn't going to do you any good. Might make you feel better about your house. I don't know. I made me ponds of water to water where with the wood that bringeth forth trees. He had all these beautiful lakes and all these beautiful ponds. And then he said, I got me servants and maidens and, and I had servants born in my house. He had people waiting on him hand and foot. Some people look at their housework and go, man, this is just plumb depressing looking at all this work that I got to do. He didn't have to do anything and he was still depressed. He had a house full of servants and, and maids and all that waiting on him, doing everything for him, and it still vexed his soul. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. He had all this livestock. I saw a Mercedes Benz one time. I had a friend of mine who was a truck driver. We were coming up by Sweetbriar College and a Mercedes Benz pulled into it and it had a license plate on it that was a famous ranch in Texas that the ranch was the size of one of their states. And that kind of is what comes in my mind when I hear about all this cattle and livestock that Solomon had, but yet it still did not do him any good. Now we get to the one thing that a lot of people believe will help them out of their depression, and that's money. I gathered me also silver and gold and, this, and the peculiar treasure of kings and uh, of the provinces. They said that his silver, the silver that he had, was so much that it could not be measured by man that you could literally pave the roads with it. And he had more gold probably on his nightstand than Bill Gates had in the bank. Everybody thinks Bill Gates has got the big bucks and some of these other people. I, I looked through how much they paid him in tribute every year and it was literally in the billions and billions and billions. It, it was like the American economy that this man had. He had all of this money and he still felt empty. Somebody told Wyatt Earp that money would make him miserable. But he said, yeah, but I could buy my, at least I could buy my own brand of misery. That's about all you can do with it. If you're not happy when you're poor, you sure ain't going to be happy when you're rich. I can tell you that right now. That's the truth. That's the truth. Poor people don't have to spend the night worrying about somebody taking their money from them. It's already gone. Poor folks can sleep a little better sometimes. Then he said, I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. Not only did he get to listen to all the latest bands back then, 
but he brought them to the house. Picture the, your favorite band and picture them coming to your house and doing a private concert for you any, anytime you want it. Well, that ought to get me out of my depression. And music is a powerful, powerful tool. But that didn't work for him and it won't work for anyone else. And then he said, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem and my wisdom remained with me. No one has ever been as great as the great King Solomon and what he had and what he accomplished and what he did. But it still didn't matter. And he made this statement. And whatever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of all my labor. Back in the 70s, a reporter asked Colonel Sanders, he's one of my heroes, of course. If you're Baptist, you better be. They asked Colonel Sanders, how much money are you worth? And he said, I really don't know. But I know that I can write a check for anything on this earth that I want and the check would clear. That's a lot of money. And Solomon said, I didn't withhold anything from me. Anything that I looked at, that I saw I wanted, I got it. And I know people that have been suffering from depression and literally bankrupted themselves shopping and buying stuff that they really didn't want, they really didn't need, but they did something to try to occupy their mind and they wound up broke and still depressed. It happens. Then he looked, said, then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, on all the labor that I labored to do, and behold, all was emptiness and vexation of my spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. So here, <clears throat> Solomon stands looking at all the stuff he had done, all the stuff he had, and he still didn't feel any better. Now for the, the coupe de grace here. I see a lot of people that try this. Sex and romance. Now, ain't nothing wrong with either one of them under the right context. But Solomon had 700 wives and 300 lovers. And still empty. People said, oh, you know, if I could just have all of that in my life, man, that would just complete me. No, it won't. If you're not right before, you ain't going to be right afterwards. Hugh Hefner probably brought more damage to marriage in this country than any single man could have ever done. Had the Playboy Mansion and a house full of these 20-somethings running around, sleeping with him at his beck and call, for money, of course. And they interviewed him and asked why did he get married with all of those in his house. And he said his greatest fear was dying alone. That's sad. That's sad. Dying alone. And here Solomon had married all of these women and they literally pulled him away from God at times. And there are people that think, well, if all, oh, if I could just have that man, boy, my life would be complete. Well, I know some ladies that'd be glad to give you a man. And be done with it. Oh, if I could just have that woman. Nah. Those things are great in the context that God intends. He got somebody for everybody. He does. But that's not what will fulfill your life and pull you out of your depression. So he concludes in Ecclesiastes 12. He said in verse 1, remember, listen to this folks, remember your creator in the days of your youth while the evil days come not 
Remember God while you are young. Don't wait till you're old to call on him. Call on him now. Nor It says, with, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw near when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. Don't wait till you're tired of life to call on God. That's one thing that will help you. And then he said in verse 10, this preacher sought to find out acceptable words and and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. He, he looked to find truth while he was suffering from this condition. He, he looked for the words of God to bring him comfort, and they will. Then he said in verse 13 and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. As you struggle with whatever you may be struggling with, it may be depression, it may be addiction, it, I don't know what it is and it really doesn't matter that I know what it is. I want you to understand that God is able. He's able. And he, you don't have to wait for God to cure you of your problem before you can serve him and do mighty things for him. As a matter of fact, he may never cure you of your problem. He may let you keep that problem so you have to rely on him every minute of the day. <clears throat> when you get to that point, and you call on him for every minute of the day. He can use you and do great things with you. It's the people that think that they got it all together. That can't do anything for God. It's people that are struggling and trying to serve God. And fighting depression and fighting all these other things. That can really do great things for God. Why? Because they rely completely on him. You start learning how to rely on God for everything, and he may not cure. He might do it, but he might not cure what you're going through, but he will let you use it to do mighty things for him. The great evangelist D.L. Moody, and you've heard me tell it many times, would quite often be in his study and the church would be full of thousands of people. And he simply said, I ain't going out there. He was clinically depressed. The men in his church would come and get him and take him by the arms and walk him out behind the pulpit. And once he got behind there, God took over and you know the rest of the story. He rocked two nations for God. The great Dwight Lyman Moody that you would think would have it all together. And look what he did, fighting depression. I cannot begin to tell you the amount of Christians that have done great things for God that have suffered some, from one problem or the other and struggled all their life. But they didn't let that destroy them, and it cannot destroy you if you focus on God. You may fight it. You may struggle with it, but you can win this. How do I know? Because I've had it for 51 years. That's how I know. And God has seen me through it. And he can see you through it, too. I'm telling you. Don't ever let your shortcomings keep you from serving God. You might be broke, you might be sick, you might be old, you might be uneducated, you might struggle with addiction, depression, or whatever, but that doesn't matter. Call on the Lord and watch and see what he can do for you if you'll trust him today. Let's bow our heads. I want you to know that nothing is too hard for God. Nothing. Doesn't matter what your situation is, whether it's physical, mental, spiritual, it doesn't matter. God is able. And he still answers prayer, people. All you've got to do is trust him. 
Perhaps you've come today and you have never trusted Christ as your Savior. I'm going to ask you to come down here and take one of these prayer warriors by the hand and say, I need to trust Christ. I need him in my life and watch him help you fight your battles. Maybe you already are saved, but man, you're going through a tough time. You're struggling and you're going to say, God, please use me in spite of my problems to work for him and serve him. Maybe there's something else on your mind. I'm going to ask you if you would all stand as we have a song of invitation. These folks waiting up front here, we got, we got enough people for all of y'all to come down here and have somebody to pray with you this morning. Don't wait another moment. Step out. Come down here and say, pray with me. Please pray with me. I'm struggling. And, and let's get this thing worked out. Let's fight. Let's stand up to the devil and not let him defeat us this morning. Whatever your need may be, would you come and pray? If you need somebody to pray with you, take one of these folks by the hand. But let's, let's get into the fight in spite of our problems today. Doesn't matter what it is. Let's pray about it. If the Lord's tugging on your heart, don't stand there. Come on, step on out. We love you. We want to pray with you. It doesn't matter if it's marriage problems, if it's health problems. It don't matter. God is able and he wants to use you, but you got to give it all to him. Come on, let's pray about it this morning. still time for you to come if the Lord's dealing with your heart. Come on. Maybe God has called you to join with this fellowship. Well, let's come and present yourself and before the church if he's been calling you to do that.
else comes after this will close. Thank you so very much. Before I let you go this morning, I want to let you know that uh, uh, starting around the first part of March, uh, we are looking to start a Sunday school for young people. And it'll start at 10 o'clock in the morning. And we need to know which parents would be willing to bring their children at 10 in the morning, all right? Anybody else, raise your hand. There we go, two more. That, that's about enough to start one right there. Okay, there's another one. And another one? All right. Well, that kind of pretty much does that, all right? And we're going to, we're talking to some people about getting involved with teaching and so forth. And hopefully we may be able to start it sometime around the first week of March. Um, because, well, one thing, we have a really great adult Sunday school class. And we'd really like a lot more people to be exposed to that as well. Mary does a fantastic job. Matter of fact, she's bird preached preach me, okay? Y'all got to hear, especially when she gets fired up now. And it's a good Sunday school class. And so that's where you really learn. That's where we learn the Bible and all, because not everybody can make it on Wednesday nights for more Bible study. And if you can, praise God. But most people can make it for Sunday school. So pray about that. Pray about, about bringing your children, and that way we will have them for two solid hours, <coughs> at least on a Sunday morning, starting around the 1st of March. I also want to remind you, Wednesday night, Lord willing, if it don't snow, and I don't see how it could, we're going to uh, uh, pick up uh, in Zechariah, I think it's chapter 4, and we're downstairs in the chapel, and uh, is that the play practice starts this, this Wednesday? Yep. Bring your kids. The, East, the Easter play is going to be awesome. Uh, especially with the kids doing it, you know? So please bring bring your kids, be part of that. And then every Friday night, we had four, we didn't have a big crowd, but we had four churches represented Friday night downstairs at 6.30. Come on and pray. You don't have to stay the whole time. You don't have to say anything, but just sit there and listen to the Lord. Let him deal with your heart. And I think Roger's looking at me like he's either going to hit me with that or he wants to make an announcement. All right. I'm make an announcement. Okay, all right. Just a few days ago, Dr. Cash put it on Facebook that he opened up the power bill and it had doubled it had. the church and the school. Mm. So I'm asking everybody to donate, and I'm starting it off with, to help pay the power bill for both our church and our school. So I'll be standing down here to wait for everybody to come on. How about that? And you can't get no more straightforward than that, kid. <laughs> We're going to do. We're going to try to do some fundraisers and stuff too, because it went over our budget twice over, and so we. And next week, next month is probably going to be just as bad. Ladies' meeting tomorrow night at six thirty. Yeah, uh, Susie Slater's husband Tom is in stage five renal failure, and he's got to get a kidney transplant. They've got him started on dialysis. Pray for him. He's a great guy, and we're looking for a touch from the Lord. Lord can heal that. He can heal that. Do we have anybody else? Yes. Bless their hearts. I know how that feels. Whew. I'd be glad when the warm weather gets here and the bugs are gone. On Tuesday. All right. For dawn. Yes. Who? Stacy. All right. In a lot of pain. All right. We're going to go ahead and close. And uh, if all hearts are clear, I'm going to ask Pastor Nicky if he'd be so kind as to just